The Bible is full of wonderful treasures that scripture calls us to learn, to love, and to live out. As the psalmist sings in Psalms 119, 162, that, that, that I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. The question that remains as we come here now is that you and I need to explore this morning is do you trust and treasure the Bible? That was what we put forth to your children. The question, though, is the same for the parents, for the adults. Do you trust and treasure the Bible? Our passage, if in Psalms 119, 105, it's also here in the monitor, is very simple. The psalmist sings, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you just open our minds and hearts. We thank you for VBS. We thank you for what you accomplished. I pray that it would just begin doing its work. And though we may not see instant uh, fruit from it, we know that it will pass the time that you would continue to water those seeds that were shown. And then just be with us here this morning. Let us hear your word. Lord, I pray that you'd capture our heart anew with the truth of Scripture and let us treasure it and trust it. We praise in Christ's name. Amen. I want to give you a couple of facts just about the Bible, just so you kind of understand. So we're kind of all on the same page. And I believe for the most part we are, but this is redundant, but that's okay. Redundancy is the key to learning. It's just some simple facts. First, the Bible is divided into the Old and to the New Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New it's written about a period over 1,600 years, dating from 1,500 B.C. to about 100 years after Christ. And it had 40 authors, which consist of 66 books. But of those 66 books, there is only one story. There's one story. And I want to go to that next slide there as we look at the monitor. Is you look at the, every story has a protagonist, who the main character is. The antagonist, who's the one that's creating the conflict. You'll see the agonist, the man who's involved in the struggle, and then the plot. So you'll see that very quickly. Here's the story of the Bible in a nutshell. From Genesis to Revelation, you see the protagonist is God. He's the main character. Now, many times if someone would come to you and say, well, who's the main character of the Bible? You might say, well, it's Moses, or it's Abraham, or Adam and Eve. You might say King David, or Solomon, or Jesus. Well, you'd be, you'd, you'd be more correct if you said Jesus, but the main person, or the main character of the story is God. He is the main point of the story. The antagonist, the one who creates the adversary, obviously is Satan, the dragon, old scratch, you know, devil, all those terms that we use for him. The, the agonist, the one who's involved in the struggle, is man. He falls from God and now is in a struggle. And it's God who's coming to save man, not man saving himself. We'll speak more on this in a minute. <coughs> but the plot, the whole, the whole summary of the Bible is what is it about? It's about reconciliation. It's about God reconciling man back to himself. Reconciling creation back to himself. Now, there's four chapters. There's four chapters in the Bible. You see, wait a second. I, I go through my Bible, and Genesis alone has 50. You know, Exodus has 40. And I'm guessing. I think I might be somewhere there. I know Matthew has 28, and Mark has 13, 16, because we preach those. James has six. So we think, what, what's, what, how many chapters do we mean? Well, it has four chapters. It's creation, the fall, redemption, and consummation. So just to, here's the thing that you're going to see as you go through the Bible. It starts with creation. It goes to the fall. It then talks about the main part of the Bible is back, actually chapter 3, God redeeming, the, the redeeming reconciliation. And then the fourth is consummation. And I want to take those for a moment and look at each and every one of those. Chapter 1 starts with the creation. That's the story of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we see that God created all that we see, all the visible. And in Colossians, we see that God created all the invisible. God created time. He created molecules and atoms. He creates all that we see and all the things that we cannot see. And the ultimate pinnacle of his creation the crowning glory of creation is when he created man and put him into the garden and then gave him a helpmeet eve from his rib 
So humanity is the crowning glory of creation. And what we see there at the end of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is that all things were good. God did a good work in six days and on the seventh he rested. It's the shortest part of the Bible. It's the shortest chapter, creation. God creating all things. And then given to man, he gives to man the, the regent of the land. You are the mediators. You are the ruler. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, he gives us that mandate. But the second chapter, as we go into Genesis 3, then gives us the fall. And we know this. This is paradise lost. This is when Adam and Eve are in a garden with everything beautiful, everything perfect, everything they needed. And in comes Satan, the first introduction. He entices Eve to sin. He causes her to doubt God's truth, God's word. He causes her to doubt God's goodness. And then he calls into question God's love for her. And seeing that what she comes to, she comes to doubt God's word. She comes to doubt God's goodness. And in the end, she doubt God's love for her. She takes of the fruit. What the fruit is, we don't know. But she takes of it, gives to her husband, and they both eat, plunging humanity into sin. This chapter reveals that in our disobedience and rebellion, you and I and all of humanity, the crowning glory of creation, have lost our vision for God. The Bible tells us that all who are in sin are in darkness. Now that does not mean that we are in a dark room and cannot see, but that we are in the dark about the truth. We cannot understand the truth about God. That's what the fall tells us. It goes not only in Genesis 3, but throughout the Old Testament, it gives us the consequences and it gives us the responsibilities of what happened because of the fall. And it says that now we, you and I cannot understand the truth about God or ourselves. That's found in Romans chapter 1, very much later, but chapter, the, the, cha the second chapter of the fall is even interwoven through its pages. We are like blind men who grope about in the darkness, but worse than the fact that we're blind is the fact that you and I do not even realize that we're blind. We're groping in the darkness, thinking that we see, thinking that we're wise, but the Bible tells us that that is not true. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that in our case, the God of this world, the, the antagonist, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers, all those who are without Christ. And that's all of us from birth until the new birth to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So we think we can see, but we truly cannot. That is the greatest deception. Thinking that we know, thinking that we understand. We're truly blind men. Scripture goes on to describe that we have distorted and blurred the divine image of God in ourselves. And we have experienced the loss of the presence of God and his goodness and that we have forever lost the fellowship of our creator. Created to be stewards of God's beautiful creation, we have become slaves to our own sin, and we are thrust into rebellion against our heavenly, lovingly Father. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3 of the Bible, not speaking of Genesis chapter 3 or Exodus chapter 3, but the third theme, the third chapter of the Bible, reveal God's plan for redemption. This chapter reveals the good news that the God of justice, the God who said, if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die, is also the God of mercy. For the God who said you shall surely die, also in that same passage, promised that I will send you a savior. Yes, God must judge sin. And as we go from Genesis 3 on, we see God doing that. We see it in, in Cain and Abel. We see it in Noah and the wickedness of the generation. We see it in Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see it in the life of Solomon in the next few weeks. We see it throughout Scripture. But you also see God's goodness and his mercy. So yes, God must judge sin as a holy God. But he also is a merciful and ready to forgive God. 
And you and I know the story of redemption, as I see here, is God sent his son. While we were yet what? Sinners, rebellious, God-haters. That's not too strong of a word. You may coil at, recoil at that, but you were a God-hater before coming to Christ. That's the truth of Scripture. You were blinded in your hate towards God. I'm not saying you were shaking your fist at God and wake up every morning, God, I hate you, you do not exist. But yet our very actions and hard attitudes express that. But the Apostle Paul writes to the Roman church these wonderful words in Romans that God demonstrated his love for us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But as we look at the next in Romans 8.31 on the monitor here, look at these words of Paul. What then shall we say to these things? About what things? About all of our sin, our condemnation. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let me ask you, who can stand before the mighty God? Goliath could not. Satan himself could not. Allah cannot. Nor can the Mormon God. Nothing can stand before our God. Not cancer, not suffering, not economic hardships. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The question begs the answer what? No, nothing. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Can you imagine that? Can I just bank on this? We may not get through the message because it doesn't matter because I can't see the clock because the, ice, the icicles are, are in the way. So, And it's too hard to get my Fitbit out here and find the time. So you just give me a holler when you've had enough. Just tap out. I don't even know what I was going to say now. Oh, I'll go back up there. Think about this phrase. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? If you're like me this week, you are feeling some guilt and shame because you failed in some way with God. You've sinned. You saw what you should not saw. see. You dwelt on something you shouldn't be dwelling on. You're carrying some anxiety or some worry that you should not be carrying. You're struggling and trusting God. And you're saying, God does not love me, but yet you claim to be a child of God. For those of us that are in Christ, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? God himself says, I will not. I will separate your sins as from the east to the west. When do those two meet? They cannot. They're opposed to each other. They never can meet. I like the old phrase that takes it. He puts out, he put in Psalms, it says that God takes our, our sins and he puts them in the deepest ocean. And I like the click hole where it says, and God puts up a no fishing sign. The benefit of chapter three of the redemption of God, the redemption of sinners, is the fact that you and I will stand not guilty before God. Romans 8, 1, this should be highlighted in your Bible. It should be memorized. And if you're going to get a tattoo, put this one on. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. It's the only one that I'll sign. So put that in your mind and put that on your heart. I have to remind myself all the way. By the way, this is not part of the message, but it's in the Bible. Because listen what it says. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And who will quarrel with God? Who can resist God's word? Who can resist God himself? Who will grab at the altars and fight with the horns of an almighty God who says, I have declared you not guilty? If this doesn't give you a, a pep in your step, if this doesn't lift up your heart today, if this does not shine light on the guilt and shame that you're suffering from today, then I don't believe anything else will. What I would have to call you to is repent and come to him. For Satan, accuser of the brethren, is, is defeated in chapter 3 of the Bible. God's redemption. Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. To disarm the rulers and the principalities of this air. In Colossians chapter 3, that he put them into shame themselves. 
God redeems his people by restoring our lost vision. God restores his people by restoring us to the image of God. For those he he saved, those he will make into his image. God, you may not be in the image of God today, but one day you will be. That is your hope. And thirdly, God redeemed his people in the third chapter of the Bible by restoring us in the fellowship. And by us being here this morning is giving evidence to our fellowship in Christ. Hence why I say it's important for us to be here even during the summer. Because when we come here and gather as a people, as collect, to hear God's word, to listen to God's word, to pray God's word, to sing God's word, and to lead, to listen and respond, you and I are being restored into fellowship. It's a picture of that beautiful picture. Then chapter 4, this is the introduction of the message. Chapter 4 details the consummation. Paradise lost, paradise redeemed, paradise restored. Amen. You and I will have eternal life. What was lost at the garden will be consummated, be recreated once again. We saw that in 2 Peter. That's the book of Revelation. Isaiah gives us beautiful word pictures of what that will look like. We're still in the dark about a lot of that, how that may look out, look like, what it may play, how it may be applied, played out. But what we have this hope is Christ will return and he will bring us with him. And Revelation tells us that he will be our God and we shall be his people. John Levin says, Jesus said to the woman at the well, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though yet he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Jesus asked her. My question today is, do you believe Jesus? That's the fourth chapter. That's our hope. His justice and mercy are displayed as in the fourth chapter of the consummation that God brings it into the great antagonist, the dragon, Satan, the devil, his adversary. As God is displayed as he restores creation and consummation as God brings us home. See, the Bible is God's story that reveals his wonder, wonderful attributes and his plan. This story is a timeless and one that is designed to be read, treasured, trusted, and shared with others. The scripture contains the wonderful words of life that transforms rebellious, disobedient children into friends and children of God. It is not meant to be hidden away, is not meant to be neglected or dismissed or disparaged or forgotten, but embraced, loved, and treasured. Now that's what we shared with the children this week, though maybe not so emphatically. Now I would like to share with you four reasons why you should trust and treasure the Word of God. Why you should trust and treasure those four chapters, those four themes of scriptures. Those 66 books, that one story of God's plan. The first one is the Bible is the only true authority in our lives. The Bible is the trustworthy and only true authority in our lives. Wayne Grumman, who is a uh, theology... Theo 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 yeah, he's a professor. I used up all my words in the introduction. Wayne Grumman, we're indebted to him this morning. I didn't want to reinvent the will. So I'm going to use some of his definitions here as we look at the Bible as the only true trustworthy source of authority. He writes here, and it's, I, I, don't think this, I don't think this is going to be on the screen, but the entirety of Scripture, or I don't think this one is, the entirety of Scripture is the Word of God. And although written by a number of humans over a long period of time, almost 1,400 years, God claims the words of Scripture as his own. Scripture, therefore, comes with the authority of God and thus cannot be challenged and must be obeyed. It's like a summons from court. You don't dismiss it and neglect it. You must attend. You must give it your attention. This is what Scripture teaches about itself, and you and I are called to believe it. He goes on to write, and this is on the monitor, that the authority of the Bible is the belief that the Bible is the word of God and has the right to command our beliefs and action. 
And I'm going to dare say, even with the number that we have here, that there are some of you that are struggling with the concept that the Bible has the right to command your beliefs and your actions. He said, no, 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 I, I believe that. I do too. But my actions and my beliefs tell differently. You know what I'm saying? We all say things. What, what's that, 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 what's that uh, disconnect? Uh, um, there's a word for that. When you believe one thing, but you act differently. I, I'm not coming to me, to me right quick. There it is. Say it again. Uh, Landon, let the record show that Landon said cognitive dissonance. And I was able to repeat it fairly well. We don't have the, we don't have the video, so we, we're, we're going to have to do the best that we have here. You need to understand that. Not only accept it mentally, but you need to come to your life and understand that. Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We need to come to understand. Let's leave this up, if you would, please. The Bible has the right to command our beliefs and actions. It has the authority. And I know as we go to older, we think, no, we have authority. Well, then go back to chapter 1 and see how that works out in chapter 2 of the Bible. That's the very struggle. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3.16, the Bible is not just a divine guidebook or a list of commands. It's not just a rule book. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a story of man's search for God, but it's God's story of searching for man and reconciliation. It is a gift from God that informs us how you and I can please an almighty creator. Look at what scripture says here in, in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Paul writes, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The Bible is profitable. We all want to make a profit, for the most part. We want, to, we, want our, we want our incoming to be more than our outgoing. Now, it rarely is. But that's what we want. We want to make a profit. Well, the Bible is profitable. And he tells us for four things. For teaching. What is the teaching of 2 Timothy? Why is the Bible profitable for teaching? Because it tells us sound doctrine. What is right. And by the way, let me give you this, just a, uh, um, an announcement for the next two weeks in Sunday school and adult Sunday school, we are looking at false doctrine and false teachers and the importance of the church and protecting the church from false teaching, false doctrine. So the next two weeks, please be for that at 945 as we close out our summer series on that. But teaching sound doctrine, what is right? The world and us, we are in a struggle in what is right. But the thing is, you and I have taken that what is right and we have absconded that and given it to the United States Supreme Court and said, you tell us what is right and what is wrong. Or the courts. Or there's something else. But the Bible tells us, no, right here, tells us what is right. How you should live. How you should love your wife. How you should serve your husband. It tells us how to do, how to raise our children, how to live, who to marry, how to marry. Now, I may not tell you that exactly, but the principles within us tells us how you and I are to live right with God, what he expects. It's also profitable for reproof. That exposes conviction and evidence. It tells us what is wrong. It looks in our life and says, here is what right living is, right thinking is, right behavior. And then it tells us when we've gone wrong. You should not do this. You should not do that. It's as a parent says, go clean your room. This is right. But when the parent, when the child does not, it then comes and reproves and tells them what they did wrong. But not only that is that the Bible, because we got plenty of people, right, in our lives who will teach us and correct us, or excuse me, reprove us. We have a lot of people who want to tell us what is right and what is wrong and what we did wrong. But here's the wonderful thing about the Bible is it then comes it's profitable for correction. That's to rectify what went wrong. It's how to get right. So how to what is right, what is wrong, and how to get right. In other words, what do I do need to do to make this better? See, this is the problem that we have when couples are fighting or parents and children are fighting or problems at work or just in Twitter. We have what is right, 
what is wrong or what you did is wrong, but we never have true correction. How to make it right. In other words, it's not enough that I asked you to forgive and Landon did an excellent job and I asked you to go and watch that video, uh, the video of his message last week if you didn't catch it or if you need a refresher. But not only is it enough to say, I ask for forgiveness and I give forgiveness. You've got to figure out how to reconcile it. How do you correct it? Because it's not enough to, to continually hit somebody upside the head. They tell you you're wrong. And you say, I'm sorry, but then you keep hitting them in the head. Well, I can't help it. I'm just, you're standing too close. Well, correct it. So the Bible tells us how to correct. If, I, if I'm a man and I'm struggling with porn and then all of a sudden I find out I'm, I'm really struggling with it, it tells me not to do it, then I need a correction. What do I need to do to make it right? How do I get it right? And then training in righteousness it's profitable for. That's to nurture one another. That's how to stay right. See, I need to know what is right. I need to know when, when I've gone wrong. I need correction. I, know how to, I need to know how to make it right. And then I need to know how to stay right. That's the profitable. That's why he tells Timothy, uh, Paul does, continue in those things that you have learned. To the Thessalonians, to the church of Thessalonians, he says, I want to supply what is lacking in your faith. Why is it profitable? Because there's a reward. It tells us what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. Why? That we may be competent, complete in our accomplishments, equipped for every good work. Don't you just want to be competent? Could you at least, at least desire to measure up to competent? God is engraving here on a curve. Jesus is the curve. We just want to be competent. The Bible says it's profitable. You see, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So the, so the Bible, we must trust and trust and treasure it because it is our authority. It is our trustworthy authority, or source of authority in our life. Number two, the Bible is clear in its revelation. The Bible is clear in its revelation. Again, Wayne Grumman writes, although that there are parts of the Bible that, we, that are hard, okay, even, even, even Peter in 2 Peter said that, some of the writings of Paul can be hard. So although there are parts of the Bible that are hard, but not impossible to understand, much of it is clear. And every believer should expect to learn from it. I wonder if you come in here this morning expecting to learn something. Do you open your Bible during devotion expecting to learn something? Believers are expected to know the Bible. Most of the New Testament letters were written to an entire congregations just like you. They weren't just written just to the leaders. And even the congregations with many Gentile Christians, those who did not grow up with the Old Testament scriptures, with no background in the Old Testament, were expected to read and understand the Old Testament. And what did they have to do many times? Uh, wait a second. This says go back to the Old Testament. What is that again? I don't even read Hebrew. Can someone in Hebrew, can someone read that for me? We're expected to understand. The Bible, though, is clear. Some of you say, well, I don't read the Bible because it's hard to understand. I understand. I understand. I agree. There are times in which it can be. But I believe you give up too soon. Because the majority of the Bible is going to be very clear to someone who just reads it with an understanding mind, praying, Holy Spirit, open my eyes and hearts. And the parts that are difficult, do you just... Do you dive into it and find out? Do you get the tools? Do you ask? Or do you just walk away and say, oh, okay. He goes on, here's on the monitor. That the clarity of scripture means that the Bible is written in such a way that its teachings are able to be understood by all who will read it, seeking God's help and be willing to follow it. That's what he says in 2 Peter. We've, I won't read the verse again. We've, we understand it. He says, I didn't give to you cleverly devised myths, but I gave you the word of God that was given to us. And it's not up for private interpretation. And I encourage you, here's where, the, 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 here's where it comes in. And I have people tell me, yeah, but Rob, my interpretation of scripture is different from yours. Okay, th there are reasonable interpretations of scripture. We talked about that in Sunday school. In this church, I, you know, most of you know that I, that I come from, I, well, I don't come from, but over the last 15 years, I've become more reformed in my understanding of scripture and of salvation. 
I come from a more, uh, I have not come from again, I, I'm coming more from a, a different perspective, but I've come to that more thought. But not everyone in this church would agree with me every all points. And, and there's, a, there's a way in which we can gather in that and still love and, and have unity in Scripture. But there is that in which it is an error. So we need to come and we need to discern those things. The Bible is not up for your own interpretation. The Bible is meant to be interpreted in, cor- in corporate bodies as elders in the church come together. And as Bereans, as we take scripture to see if such things are so. And I agree, don't take my word for it. Search scripture. And I think I've proven myself to be humble enough for when some of you, and I call them gospel drive-bys, is when I'm standing on the back and you come back and you say, you were wrong in that, I don't believe that, and then you just keep on walking. You know? I'm going to get a shirt that says, don't tread, tread on me and don't shoot me. You know, one of those things. Come share with me, but please don't do it as you're walking and I'm shaking hands with a smile on my face. Do it in a loving, humbly way. Say, I have a question about what you said or what you taught. Dustin, Landon, Randy, all those who are, we're, we're, we're humble enough, we're working on being even more humble to where you can come and sit with us and we can say, yeah, I misspoke. I wasn't clear enough. Bible's clear, Rob's not. You know that, you know, uh, 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 Amen. <laughs> Sometimes I sound like Ozzy Osbourne, right? <laughs> but we, <laughs> can we edit some of this audio out, I think? But Rob, God, Rob. <laughs> see, here you go. God wrote the scriptures that they may understood, be understood and obeyed. So though we may struggle with interpretations at times, God has called and said, I'm clear that there may be some questions but it is clear. Number three, not only is the Bible clear in its revelation, but the Bible is necessary to, for us to know our purpose. Wayne Grubin writes, and I believe this is on the screen, the necessity of scripture means that the Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel. How can you know the story without reading the book? For maintaining spiritual life and for knowing God's will, but it is not necessary for knowing that God exists or for knowing something about God's character and moral laws. In other words, there is regular revelation. We see that in in Romans. That everything about God, you can know the existence of God by looking at creation and nature. But the Bible is special revelation. And everything in it is necessary for us to know the gospel, God's reconciliation. We can know God's creation to a degree, but we cannot know the rest of the story except with Scripture. Bookshelves in stores are filled with books and tapes and manuals written by mostly well-intentioned but uninformed authors who dispense advice, dispense advice on how to know and fulfill your purpose in life. They collected physiology, uh, whatever behavior, and social data in order to help us order our lives, yet they do so without taking into account God himself and scripture. Scripture describes those people as claiming to be wise but became fools. The psalmist declares the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the Bible is necessary. When you come to us for counsel, it is biblical counsel. It's to come back and see what scripture has as it lights our way and helps us mirror our heart. Without the truth of scripture, you and I would be foolish and without understanding. The scripture is necessary to please God and fulfill our purposes in life. King Solomon wrote thousands of years ago that the end of the matter has been written and spoken and all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Where will you know how to fear God and keep his commandments outside of Scripture? The Bible is necessary for all things. Is the Bible necessary for me to know how to buy a house? Yes. Because it will tell you not what house to buy or how much, but it will tell you financial biblical principles to help you guide you in your thinking. It may not tell you who to marry, but I tell you, if you, make, if, you, if you date and marry someone without seeking the Bible's counsel, it is a crapshoot. Is that a Greek word? I think that's translated from Greek somewhere. 
Why? Does it tell you those things? No, but it does tell you the principles of what to look for and how to filter those things through. For most of us, we make decisions in our lives today without once looking in Scripture. We go into debt. We make big decisions. We change jobs. We leave churches. We join churches without once consulting God's Word. Not as a medium and not as a crystal, crystal uh, ball, but as one is seeking the guidance and the teachings of its Word. It is necessary for life for your marriage, for your children, for your work. The number four, the last. The Bible is sufficient to guide us in life. Look here in the monitor. The sufficiency of Scripture means that Scriptures contain all the words of God that He intended His people to have. It's not everything that God has to say in all things. It's not all of his musings. But it's all that he intended for you and I to have at each stage of redemption to history. Creation, the fall, redemption, consummation. And now it contains all the words of God that you and I need for salvation, for trusting him perfectly and for obeying him perfectly. Do I have questions for God that I cannot find in scripture? Yes. I would like to know more. There are things that I can't wait to ask him. But I imagine that when I get to heaven, it won't matter. But the scripture is sufficient to counsel you. It is sufficient to guide you. It is sufficient to encourage you, to strengthen you, and to comfort you in those times. Too many off, too many times we're going to pills, going to doctors, going to prescriptions, going to this, going to that. And those all have its, its, its place in the common grace of God. But if you do all that without going to the sufficiency and trusting sufficiency of scripture, then, then I want to encourage you to do so. The scriptures are sufficient to reveal the way of salvation. I don't need any other pla uh, plates or tablets from a God called Moron Morani. That just sounds moronic to me. I don't need any other types of things to tell me that if I give my life for God, then, then I'm going to go to heaven with 40 virgins. I, I don't need anything else to tell me those things. The Bible is sufficient. And I am guilty as just as you are, as many times I have to conv uh, I'm convicted that I read more books about the Bible than I do the Bible. That's kind of silly. That's like me going to Facebook and reading about my wife all the time instead of just spending time with her. Seems kind of silly, doesn't it? Probably maybe safer, but man, it's kind of silly. <laughs> Only safer because you know, it won't be safe for very long. I'm already in trouble. But the Bible is sufficient to guide me how to get out of this. I got correction and training and righteousness coming later. The scriptures are sufficient to reveal the whole truth of God and sufficient to reveal the real truth and will of God. Do you want to know what to do with the rest of your life? Don't make a decision until you've found counsel from his word. Seek the counsel of godly men and women. So in closing, I know you didn't think this place was coming. But last week we asked the children what their hard attitude was concerning the scripture. And if you can just throw that up there. We asked them, check your attitude about the Bible, your hard attitude. Where are you? It's the thermostat, it just measures, it doesn't set the temperature, it's just measuring what the temperature is. Where are you at when it comes to the Bible? To reading it, to trusting it, to treasuring it. And don't tell me, oh, it's really good. No. Let me ask your wife how it is. Let me ask your employees. Let me ask you your friends who may not even know that you go to church. I'm not interested. I rarely read it. I should read it. That's getting better. I make myself read it. Okay, right, that's pretty good. Or well, I want to read it. What's your hard attitude about the Bible, about God's word? Do you trust and treasure it? If you and I are honest, we probably don't score as high as we should. Well, that's the one thing about God's grace. We're not going to be condemned for being at the bottom. But I would really try to probably counsel you and encourage you and challenge you on whether or not you truly are a child of God. 
So you might be in there, maybe not at the bottom, but maybe in the middle. The gospel is God's not going to condemn you, but do you treasure and do you love him? There's so many things competing for our attention, is it not? That you and I neglect to carve out time to read God's word. <clears throat> Here's where it's going to hit. Don't, cl- don't close me off here. You and I both are in this together. We are guilty of treasuring other things over Scripture. Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, Hulu, work, washing your hair, or some other activity. I know you don't have five minutes in the day to open its pages. I know your time is just so much, right? You don't have five minutes a day. You don't have ten minutes. Good Lord, could I have 30? There's no way. I've got to binge watch Luke Cage. I've got so much other stuff I need to do. This show is going off Netflix next week. I've got to finish it before now. It's where we are, right? Because if I would say, how, what's, your check, what's your attitude about Netflix? What's your attitude about Dwayne, Wayne, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson? What's your attitude about whatever? I bet you'd skyrocket up there. That's just plain. That's just your own heart condemning you, not me. In summary of the week, we challenge the children that the Bible is, is a treasure. And it's a treasure that you and I are to explore. Because God wrote the book. The Bible changes lives. The Bible is true and it doesn't lie. And the Bible never go away. This morning I put that challenge to you. Do you treasure and trust the word of God? Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up. I'm going to ask Landon if you wouldn't mind being up here at the end for prayer. I know that we're going to be going to ice cream a little bit here in just a moment, but if just take a moment. Would you pause and consider what I've shared? I tried to share the truth in a winsome, but challenging, encouraging way. This message spoke to me as I wrote it because I myself struggle in all these areas of treasuring and trusting God's word. Would you pray and ask God, Father, help me to trust and treasure it more. I believe there's probably every one of us here need to trust and treasure it more. Would you ask for that commitment today? That love comes from God. Lord, give me a greater measure of faith. Give me a greater measure of grace when I fail to measure up to what I should do. But let me love your book more. Would you take a moment to pause, consider, pray, and respond whatever the Holy Spirit may be asking of you this morning. It might be in understanding one of the chapters of the Bible. It may be in trusting and treasuring one of the points of the Bible. The sufficiency, the necessity, the clarity, and the authority. Would you respond to the Holy Spirit's work this now? Father, let us see your word as David, who said, Their word I will hide in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let us trust and treasure your word. Father, if they're like me, if we're honest, we have failed in many ways. And we thank you that there's no shame, there's no condemnation for how long or how often we read your word. But help us to realize that it is your love letter written for our good and for your glory. So give us a greater measure of faith that we may confidently approach your word knowing that it's the words of life. Where we struggle, let us find encouragement from someone. Let us find maybe a reading buddy, someone that we can read together, study together. But Lord, let us begin this morning to commit to praying that your word become greater treasure and that our trust in it would be stronger. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.